Garth, all yours. Great, thanks. Thanks, Simon, and thanks very much for the opportunity to speak here this evening. Um, I was just saying to Simon before the session, I don't think I've ever done one of these Power Hour presentations, but he reminded me that we did do one a long time ago. I think it was in about 2012 or maybe even before that. So it's been quite a long time. So it's nice to be here this evening, and thanks very much to all of you for taking the time to come and listen to what I've got to say. Um, I'm going to try and push through these slides so that we get a decent amount of time for questions and answers at the end, because I always find with most of these presentations, there's always some juicy questions that come out and everybody learns. And in fact, that interaction is where the, the fun stuff often is, I find. So what I'm going to do is just give a little bit of a background to how 2017 has been so far in a very, very broad spectrum look. And then I'll give you um, a couple of stock picks, technical stock picks, which I think are looking interesting going into 2018, based on some of the scenarios that we kind of know at the moment. Although, do we really know much? I mean, I think there's such a variety of possible scenarios that could happen this year, particularly as we approach the end of the year with the ratings agencies uh, meeting on the 24th of November possible downgrade there. And then, of course, we've got the ANC elective conference happening in December. And that is still somewhat binary at, at this stage. So having all of that as unknowns does make the, the market a little bit difficult to read going into 2018. But I'm going to do my best and give it my best shot in terms of making a couple of picks uh, of stocks that I think are looking quite good from a technical standpoint and also from a fundamental perspective. Right, so if we have a look at some of the key considerations that have driven or that have been apparent in 2017, it's these points, and I'll just quickly run through them and then we'll look at some charts to illustrate what I'm talking about. <clears throat> First of all, um, the overseas markets, the developed markets have been very, very strong across the board generally. Look at the US, look at the S&P 500, how it's continued to power higher and higher and higher. Look into the east where the Nikkei is now making you know, new highs since 1991. The Hang Seng has been very strong. Um, the DAX is very, very strong. So across the board, the developed markets have been pretty, pretty, pretty strong, generally speaking. Um, volatility has been very, very low. And I'll show you the VIX chart just now. It's incredible. We're sitting at like uh, lows in volatility that were last seen back in 1993. And on a consistent basis, in fact, it's probably the longest protracted period of low volatility that we've seen uh, forever, really. It's been a very, very low, low volatility year. The top 40 has broken out of its three-year trading range, and that's only happened quite recently. Uh, we've had three years of basically sideways market, no, no return. Uh, in fact, up until June of this year, the JSC had given you 0% return over three years other than dividends. And all of a sudden, in the last four months or so, four or five months, all of a sudden, we're up more than 20%. So a big breakout has happened over the last uh, little while. We'll talk about that. The RAND has weakened over the past few months. Uh, particularly, it started to weaken before Malusi Gigaba became, became the finance minister, but it seems to have sort of accelerated its weakening since he became the, the new finance minister. And we'll show that on the chart as well. And then lastly, the participation on the JSC's rally has actually been very, very narrow. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit more about that. It's, it's Yes, we're making new all-time highs on the All Share Index and on the Top 40 Index, but it's really due to a handful of stocks that are driving this market. If you scratch below the surface, you'll see that the participation in this rally has actually been very, very limited. And, um, and that, that's quite interesting. So this is the, um, the MSCI World ETF. And I just want to show this chart. I'm sorry. I want to show this just to illustrate the first point that I made on the previous slide, that these developed markets have been very, very strong, and they've gone up in a very, very linear fashion with no meaningful pullbacks at all. So have a look at that tight channel that is intact over there. This is start of 2017 over there. That's where jo Donald Trump won the U.S. election back in the beginning of November 2016. Um, that's been one year, I think the 8th of November, if I'm not wrong, was the day that he won the election. And that was, of course, yesterday. So it's been a, a year since Donald Trump won the U.S. election. And you can see how linear this upward trend has been. There's been no meaningful pullbacks at all during the last year, which is very, very unusual. This next slide shows, I, I find this actually quite fascinating. It shows you the maximum drawdown for the S&P 500 for each year 
looking back over the last 100 years, just more than 100 years, actually, because it goes back to 1914. So 103 years. And it'll show you that in most years, I mean, if you just eyeball that and draw a, a sort of a, a basic line through there, you'll see that most years you can expect to get a 10% pullback in the market at some stage during the year. It's quite uncommon not to have that. And then, of course, you have your big um, market crashes where, like the 1929 crash where you saw these huge drawdowns uh, year after year. There's 2008 over there where we saw the market pretty, pretty much halve. Um, and there have been a couple of other big ones along the way. There's 1987, uh, etc. Now, this year, we haven't even had a 3% pullback on the S&P 500. I think the biggest drawdown for the S&P 500 year to date has been 2.9%, which is remarkable. And that hasn't happened at all, ever, on this chart. There's no plotting, even these small ones that you see occasionally here. None of these have ever You've never seen a year in the last 100 years where the S&P 500 hasn't pulled back uh, you know, more than 3% like this year. So this year has been incredibly strange from that point of view. And it talks to this next slide, which is the VIX, the Volatility Index, uh, as measured by the Chicago Board Options Exchange. And what it is basically is a measure of implied volatility that is used when pricing up S&P 500 options. And you can see that... Obviously, you have your periods of high and low volatility. We had very low volatility at the end of 1993, moving into 1994. Then again, in 2007, volatility was very low. That was just before 2008, when we had the financial crisis and the market crashed. And you can see volatility went through the roof after that. But now we've had a year where, for a very substantial part of this year, the VIX has actually spent its time below 10 down here, which is incredibly low. And it also just talks to the previous slide and the fact that there have been no meaningful pullbacks on the S&P 500 throughout this year. And I, I guess this is a function of cheap money, low interest rates, and the expectation that interest rates are likely to remain pretty low for, for quite some time to come. Uh, and no, you know, real, no real risks in the market that's that's being priced in at the moment and the contrarian might, might say well you know if we if we've got such low volatility surely you know the market may be too complacent and that might be the case but i just point it out because i think it's very interesting and it's made for an, a year which has been quite difficult to trade in the sense that there's been such low volatility um, i've read a lot recently about hedge funds that are closing down and whatever and I think the main reason for that is just it's very, very difficult for a hedge fund to make money in, a in, in an environment where there's no volatility. You actually need a bit of volatility around in order to trade the market, in order to, to, to capitalize on that. I think the big winners this year have been those that have been invested in ETFs uh, that track the, the big developed markets because you've just had a very nice linear move to the upside, no significant pullbacks, and that's actually been – you know, quite quite a nice ride if you've been invested in that stuff. Will it will it continue like this? I can't say so. Uh, I don't know, but I doubt it. I, I just don't think that such low levels of volatility can stay with us forever. All right. Then looking at our, our local market, this is now the top 40 index. I like to look at the top 40 rather than the all share index, but I mean that's just a personal preference. Um, you'll find that the two indices do generally track each other quite closely anyway because the constituents that make up the two indices are so similar. So you'll find that the shapes of the graphs generally are very, very similar. Now, what's notable here, I think I should stand a bit closer to this thing. There we go. Um, what's notable is the sideways move that, that I spoke about where this market's basically tracked sideways in a sideways choppy range for three years. You can see that's 2014 over there. And really, it's just gone up and down and up and down and up and down within this range. And like I said, in June of this year, if you just go back to where that was, you were effectively flat over three years. From June 2014 to June 2017, you'd made no money in the market from an index perspective. And all of a sudden, we've had this very powerful move to the upside over the last couple of months. And uh, that's been driven by a couple of things. One is the weakening of the RAND, but two is the performance of NASPIS, mainly NASPIS, and then a couple of other large cap sh uh, shares that follow behind it. 
and I'll talk about those in a moment and I'll show you the, the lack of participation in the market and how few stocks have actually con continued and, and contributed to driving this market higher. This is the Rand dollar exchange rate, and I think this is a very important chart to keep in the back of our mind when looking at the market. Because remember that the JSE is, and, and the top 40 in particular, is quite uh, sensitive to a weaker Rand. Sorry, let me just try and go back here. There we go. That's where I want to be. Um, this is a weekly chart of the Rand dollar exchange rate. And you can see, obviously, we had the blowout here at the end of 2015. That was Nenegate over there when uh, the finance minister was first fired. And then Pravin Gordon came in shortly after that. And we saw the Rand strengthening, admittedly, from a very weak level. I mean, that was a blowout move. There's no doubt about that. And the Rand then began to strengthen. Throughout 2016, it strengthened. And through 2017, it's been relatively stable kind of formed a bit of a base here. But now the fact that it's actually broken above this downward trend, that's quite significant from a technical standpoint. It's telling you that the RAND has now begun a, a, a new trend of weakness and there are weaker targets in place for the RAND. So 1490 is quite a big level. You can see that's from those swing highs that we've got in mid 2016 over there. That dotted line is at 1490-ish. Uh, I think there's a fair chance that the RAND could be going towards that sort of area. Um, the break above 1370 over there, that was quite significant from a technical perspective. So it now appears as if we're in an, in an environment of shorting the RAND on, on any strength. Uh, I see this afternoon it's been it's a little bit weaker. It was trading at about 1426 when I left home earlier. Uh, which is weaker on the day, and that's on the possibility and the, on rumors that Jacob Zuma is going to make a big announcement about free tertiary education for all South Africans, which is going to cost us 40 billion rands that we just don't have. So, and of course, who's going to you know argue with that but politically? Who's going to say that's a bad move? I mean, it's, it's quite clever of Jacob Zuma, quite cunning actually, if he does go ahead with that, but not very clever from a financial perspective for the country. But that's not going to be his problem. It's going to be his successor's problem if he pushes it through. Um, so this is a weekly chart of the RAND, uh, the RAND dollar. And I just want to look at a daily chart here now. So this is looking at more recent trading action. This is effectively just 2017 for the year to date. You can see that there's this large triangular pattern which has formed over the last, say, seven or eight months. And it broke out through the upper boundary of that triangle. In technical analysis terms, this is textbook stuff. Notice how it broke out, came back. They call that a goodbye kiss over there. And uh, so I suppose you can kiss the RAND goodbye. <laughs> and, and it started to weaken quite substantially thereafter. Um, and obviously the, the, the recent medium-term budget policy statements and whatever contributed quite a bit towards the weakening of the RAND as well and the, the situation that we currently find ourselves in. Again, if you take the height of this triangle and you project that distance up from where the breakout occurred, that gives you a target of 14 Rand 90. So it looks on a sort of a medium term basis like we could be heading out towards 14 90, maybe 15 Rand to the dollar. But there are obviously some sort of unknowns out there. Um, we've got the ratings agencies meeting on the 24th of November where I think it's become generally consensus expectation that we probably will get downgraded now. Uh, if that does happen and our domestic debt gets downgraded to junk status, then there's anywhere between 100 to $150 billion worth of government bonds that would potentially need to be sold because we'll fall out of the, the world government bond index. Um, and that's, that's substantial. I mean, that's a hell of a lot of money that would need to be moved out. And that could drive the RAND weaker. There might be some offset from a few other things, which maybe it's not. Maybe it ends up not being as much as that. But by and large, from everything I've read, it suggests that there could be quite a big outflow out of the bond market, which would then also serve to weaken the RAND potentially. Of course, if they give us a lifeline and they don't downgrade us and give us until next year's budget in February, then maybe the RAND um, strengthens a little bit on that. But I think by and large, the consensus expectation for now seems to be that the downgrade is quite likely. Uh, and then, of course, the other big event that we've got coming out to the, to, uh, in December is the ANC elective conference. Um, and that's a, that's a huge one, you know, is first of all, will, it, will the conference go ahead? 
or will somehow, somehow it will be something happen that prevents it from going ahead. That's a possibility. And if it does go ahead, who wins? Uh, you know, does it, is it an NDZ win? Is it a Cyril Ramaphosa win? Uh, and how do the markets view that? So there's a lot of ifs, buts, and maybes. And I don't think it's, there's no clear cut answer as to which way this thing is going to go. So we live in interesting times at the moment. But from a pure technical perspective, if I exclude all of that noise and just look at the chart of the RAND, um, it does to me look like the probability is that it's still got to go weaker uh, from here. All right, the next one, next chart. Okay, this is now, let's go back here. This is something I, I put together. So it's the, this figures here are a little bit out of date, but not by much. They're about 10 days old. So the, the picture's more or less still the same. What it is, is the contributions of all the 40 stocks that make up the top 40 index. There you've got your top 40 index, the return to date, as it, at, at the time that I put these, this slide together. And then it shows you the contributions of each of the stocks. Now, what's quite apparent is that only about a quarter of the stocks have actually outperformed the index. Three quarters of the stocks in, in the top 40 have actually underperformed the index. And approximately half of them are, in fact, negative for the year to date. And if you look at this, this is really where the interesting stuff happens. Because here's NASPIS, with again, at that stage it was 65%, it's a bit more by now. Um, Richmond, 44% gain for the year to date. Those are the two biggest stocks that make up the, the weightings of the top 40 index. And I'll show you the weightings in a moment. The next one, Anglo American, is also one of the top five stocks in the index. So if we just quickly look here. This is, I get this information off satrix.co.za. And if you ever want to look up the weightings of this, the stocks in the top 40 index, I actually always find this the best place to go. Because if you go to satrix.co.za, um, go and look at the top 40, uh, the Satrix 40 rather, and then have a look at the fund uh, constituent details and it's updated every single day and it'll show you what percentage each stock makes up of the top 40 in terms of its weighting. So this is today's slide and you can see, have a look here, NASPIS now makes up 23.5% of the weighting of the top 40 index. So about a quarter of the weighting of this index is, con is contributed by one stock and that's NASPIS. Next up is Richmond which makes up about 10% of the index, Bulletin making up 8 8.7% and then Anglo's down here, almost 5% and British American Tobacco making up just over 4%. Now, if you add those five together, only five shares, they make up 51% of the value or 51% of the weight of the top 40 index. So it just goes to show how skewed the weightings are in this index uh, and very, very much weight uh, skewed towards NASPIS. That's, that is significant. So if you go back and you have a look at this previous slide that I showed you, the fact that NASPIS is the biggest stock in the market and Richmond is the second biggest stock in the market, and both of those just so happen to be the first and second best performers for the year to date, and they've completely shot the lights out streets ahead of everything else. It just goes to show that the actual participation in this rally hasn't been very broad. If you've been in the wrong stocks, you, it hasn't felt like a bull market at all. In fact, if you've been in some of the stuff like the domestic retailers and those sort of shares, that, that stuff is in a horrible, horrible bear market at the moment. So it's been a stock picker's market, uh, and, and I suspect it will probably remain so going into next year. All right, so some key considerations as we look forward to 2018 then. Um, Will the status quo remain the same? In other words, will the U.S. markets just continue to grind higher with no volatility to speak of? Uh, or, or, or is there something going to happen there to shake up the volatility a bit? I, would, I, I think it's a brave person that says the status quo is going to stay the same. I, d I seriously doubt it's going to stay the same. What the catalysts might be, I'm not sure, but there could be any one of a number of things that, that, that could sh shake up the status quo slightly. Will the RAND remain weak into 2018? And again, that's not a given. Uh, you know, my technical outlook is that it probably will remain weak. But what happens if we get a surprise outcome in, uh, in, in December at the ANC elective conference? What happens if Cyril Ramaphosa wins and everything suddenly looks positive 
and investors say, right, we're happy, we've got money to, 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 to invest in South Africa, could the RAND strengthen on that basis? So it's not a given that the RAND is going to just remain weak. Technically, I think it could, it, it, technically, I think it probably looks like it wants to remain weak, but it's not a given from a fundamental perspective. Um, and then leading on from that, will the large heavyweight stocks on our market continue to outperform at the expense of the domestic stocks, or will we see a, a, a massive turnaround in that? All right. And, and, and sort of to question all of this, yeah, will the RAND strengthen and do the domestic stocks catch a bid on a positive political outcome in 20, 2017, December? You know, if, if we do get a positive political outcome in December, I think the market's really not particularly positioned for that. My expectation in that case would be that you'd probably find a lot of the domestic stocks would need to re-rate upwards quite quickly. And I don't think the market's really positioned for that at the moment. So you could find a little bit of a scramble into the likes of some of the retail stocks and maybe the banking stocks and that sort of thing, which are very much unloved at the moment. Uh, so just keep that in mind. You know, if we get a surprise outcome in December and we, and, and we get a positive political outcome in December, you know, this whole status quo and the, the shape of the market that we've become accustomed to this year could actually be quite different. But anyway, with that backdrop and given the uncertainties that I've spoken about and, and the fact that there's quite a lot of binary possibilities to these various outcomes, um, I've put together a list of 10 stocks which to me look technically quite good at the moment. And to some extent, I think, depending on, on, on what happens in December, um, probably could still do okay into next year. I, I think it's quite a nice mix of stocks. There's, there's different sectors, different areas of the market here. But the, overlying, or the overriding theme with all of these is that they are all um, technically looking quite good. So that's the list of stocks, and I'm going to run you through each of them. And then I've got two bonus stocks at the end, which we'll talk about briefly as well. So the first one is Anglo-American. Uh, that breakout through um, that horizontal resistance over there is a bullish break. And you can see the stock has continued to power higher since then. There's quite a nice upward trend which remains intact. The pullback towards that upward trend would bring in support at about 270 Rand. And if you've got a deeper pullback from there, then this lateral, what was resistance, then would become support on a pullback. And that would, uh, that would come in at 240 Rand. So I think Anglo still looks like a buy on dips at the moment. It's just a question of how much it dips. Is it going to dip to 270 or does it break this upward trend and dip a, a bit deeper, in which case you'd be buying it somewhere down here. Then Aspen, it's been disappointing for the last while, but what I do quite like about it is it's quietly gone on to make a new 52-week high recently. In other words, a new high for the, for the last year. And you've got this very large saucer bottom pattern that's formed over the last year or so. Uh, I, I quite like these setups. I, I've always liked Aspen fundamentally. I think it's a great business uh, growing its geographic footprint globally all over the world. Uh, very well managed business. Yes, they've had their wobbles here and there. They got, they got a bit of a, a, a bloody nose in Venezuela. Uh, but that's all been taken into account now. And, and I think that the base is fairly low for Aspen, and it does look as if things are starting to improve, both fundamentally and technically. And as I said, I do like the fact that it's actually broken to a new 52-week high, and it's been making higher lows and higher highs over the last couple of months. So to me, this whole basing pattern over here, and the fact that it's breaking out above the resistance there, above 315, actually looks quite bullish for further medium-term gains. And this is a kind of stock that I think will still do well in a, in a weakening RAND environment, um, given its offshore exposure. All right, then Barlow World, also gradually grinding its way higher. You can see the pattern of higher lows and higher highs over here. What I quite like here is the exposure to the resources sector and also to the fact that obviously a big part of Barlow World's business is the exposure to Caterpillar and the yellow, yellow equipment um, that they sell through their Caterpillar franchise. And a lot of stuff that I've read suggests that there's now, you know, we've entered into a replacement cycle where a lot of that equipment needs to be replaced, uh, both at a, at a mining level and also at an agricultural level as well. So there's quite a lot of demand. So, uh, and, and that is illustrated in the share price performance over here. It's been moving higher nicely since June 
pattern of higher lows and higher highs. That upward trend, you can't argue with that. And also the fact that your 50-day moving average is pointing upwards indicates strong medium-term upward uh, momentum. So your support here comes in at about 130 Rand per share. And for the time being, I think if it dips to 130 and reverses up from there, you can probably buy that. As you can see, looking at this chart, there's no meaningful overhead resistance that it needs to contend with. Um, so you know, the, the, the trend is your friend. And at this stage, the trend here does look uh, quite positive. All right, then Bidcorp is the next one. So this is obviously spun out of Bidvest. And um, this has a lot of Bidvest's off, offshore operations, quite exposed in the UK, uh, among other places as well. What I like here is obviously that it's, it's their offshore businesses, so it is well positioned for a weakening rand. And also, technically, I like the fact that there appears to be an inverted head and shoulders pattern busy forming over here. Uh, if it can break out above 320 rand per share, that would be a bullish break, and that would project further upside. Uh, and, and I quite like the look of this. So overall, I think this is one to own on a medium term basis. And particularly if it breaks above 320 Rand, then that looks quite bullish, I think. Okay, then BHP Bulletin. And by the way, these are not in, in order of preference. They're just in alphabetical order. You might have noticed that. Um, so it's not to say that the first stock I spoke about is my favorite. They're, they're not in any particular order. Um, so BHP Bulletin, the break above 255 Rand here was bullish. Uh, that is, you can see quite a nice powerful move to the upside over the last couple of days. That 255 Rand area should now present quite strong support on any pullback. Uh, so it remains a buy on dips, I think. It's a bit stretched right now in the short term, but I do think that if it starts to come back into this sort of area here, you can probably look to accumulate the stock there. It's pretty well supported at, at, at that 255 Rand area. Right, then Richmond. Also looking good, as I said, it's been one of the two biggest contributors to the gains on the top 40 this year. The upward trend that's intact here is, is fantastic. I mean, it goes back further than to the left of this chart that I've drawn over here. I've just tried to keep it relatively short term with that trend that I've drawn in there. But the, there's a very, very well-defined upward trend on this stock that goes back quite some time, even further to the left of this graph. Right now, support comes in at around about 125 Rand per share. Uh, and if it dips to that area, you've got your uptrend there, you've got your 50-day moving average over there as well, I would think that that presents an opportunity to buy the dip in, in Richmond. And again, as long as that uptrend remains intact, I think I'd remain bullish on the stock. Then clicks. By and large, you haven't wanted to own South African retail at all this year, but there is one shining light in the retail sector, and that is clicks. Uh, it's a very defensive stock. Obviously, you know what Clix is. It's a pharmaceutical slash cosmetics type of type of business. Very defensive in its in, in its business. Um, it's not exposed so much to discretionary spend as as the likes of say Woolworths and Trueworths and those kind of retailers are. Um, Clix is is very well positioned to take advantage of sort of any economic environment really, uh, given the product line that they sell. And also, they're very aggressively rolling out new stores. So things are looking pretty good for clicks. Uh, uptrend is very, very neat. You can see how perfectly every time the stock is pulled back to this rising trend, it finds support. That support level comes in right now at about 155 Rand per share. It tallies, it ties in with the 50-day moving average as well. Notice how each time the 50-day moving average has been tested, it's been met with buying interest. So again, the trend is your friend. Or if you pull to run, you say the trend is your friend till the bend at the end. And for the time being, the trend is still your friend. Uh, so I would continue to back this. So you know, I don't think you can just, you know, the, to me, the trend is intact until it's proven otherwise. And I like this. And I think if, you, if you're wanting to have any exposure to South African retail, this one still looks good. Then Capitec, a similar sort of scenario. I mean, this share just goes up and up and up. It makes higher lows and higher highs all the time. There's a very well-defined upward trend intact here. Again, this trend goes back further than further to the left of the graph than what I'm showing over here. Um, you know, the more times a, a stock touches a trend line and the trend line holds as support, the more valid that trend is. And there's no doubt that this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's coming up for the eighth time that it's testing this trend just on this part of the graph that I'm showing you. So 
at around about 900 Rand, there's a lot of support for Capitec. I think if it pulls back into that area, it remains a buy on dips. And I do think that at some stage, the stock is going to probably you know, hit the magical 1,000 Rand per share mark. It needs to take out those highs, which are about 950 Rand. But I suspect it's going to come down a bit first and then get involved down at the lower levels here. And that'll probably then precede a move through that resistance to make a new high. All right, then Naspis, the stock that only knows one way. Uh, just unbelievable, this thing. Absolutely unbelievable. And when I looked at the technicals here, I sort of I struggled a bit because it's just, you know, the support levels are actually quite far away. When initially I thought, well, there's lateral support down here at 3,000 Rand, but that would be a massive pullback that it would need to do to get back to that area. So I think initial support, I would see at about 3,250 Rand per share over there. If it pulls back towards that sort of area, then that's where I would be quite comfortable looking to buy the dip in, uh, in Naspers. Obviously, the big asset in, in Naspers is, is Tencent. And this week, something quite interesting happened with Tencent. There was a, a, a very significant uh, put warrant interest in the East, in, in Hong Kong, where a number of the big investment banks had um, written put warrants to a number of institutions out, out in the East, um, BNP, Paribas, Goldman Sachs, um, I think UBS was another one. Anyway, bottom line, it was a, a knockout put, and sorry if this is all complicated, but I'll, I'll try and simplify it in a moment. It was effectively a knockout put warrant. And if the price went up above a certain level, those put warrants got knocked out. They were no longer valid. And that's basically what happened. So what, what you effectively had is a whole bunch of institutions that had bought these put warrants, which allowed downside protection in, in the event of any weakness in the price of 10 cent. But if the price went up and it went up beyond a certain level, then those put warrants ceased to exist. Now, that's what happened this week. The, the put warrants got knocked out, and what it meant was that a whole bunch of these investment banks that had written the put warrants to their clients had to now scramble and buy back their hedge on Tencent. And it was estimated that there was about a billion dollars worth of Tencent stock that needed to be bought back in order to unwind the hedge on those put warrants. So that's been uh, – uh, uh, sorry, I know it's complicated. but. <laughs> But anyhow, it's, it, it was part of the reason why Tencent pushed higher quite aggressively at the start of this week, where it was up, I think, on two successive days, it was up 2% twice in a row. And it's finally started to come off a little bit today. And I think that's we now started to see the unwind of some of those derivative hedges, and hence why Tencent has started to come down. And, and Naspis has also begun to um, give back a little bit of its recent strength. But anyway, be all of that as it may. Um, from a pure technical perspective, I think 3,250 Rand down here is where you find some support for NASPAS if it gets back to that area. All right. And then South 32 is another resource stock. So there's, you, know, you can see there's a, a little bit of a slant towards resource stocks in this list. You've got Anglos, Billiton, South 32, and then indirectly you've got Barlow World as well, which is also – um, exposed in some in some way towards resources. South 32 is looking very good. Um, there's a big gap in the chart down here at about 35 Rand. It seems to be coming off the boil. The uptrend also comes in at 35 Rand. So I would think that if it pulls back into that 35 Rand per share area, then I think there's a chance that that's where it will find support and it'll probably look to try and fill that gap. And if you can get it down there and buy a reversal up from that area, it looks quite good as a buying opportunity. All right, and then I mentioned that there would be two bonus charts that I would talk about. So the, this one is Anchor Capital. Um, most of you probably know about Anchor Capital. Peter Armitage, who started the firm, and it was a hero of the stock market from when it listed at about two rand a share, and it rallied up until mid-2015 or so. It went from two rand, I think the peak was 19 rand per share. And in the last two years, 20. 16 and 2017, the share price has just been going down and down and down and down. And there has been a bit of negative fundamental um, news around the company. They made a few bad acquisitions and whatever. But what I quite like about this company is that it has continued to gradually attract new assets and grow its assets under management. And an asset management business is very much dependent on that. It's dependent on assets under management, which they then earn fees on and ultimately hopefully earn some performance fees on at some stage as well. Now, the, the, the company's 
assets under management is still pretty much intact, I, I see it. Um, and what we also have now is a stock market that's broken out to new all-time highs. So if you factor those two things in together, um, it probably does bode fairly well for an asset management firm looking out to next year. And, you, and, I, and I would expect that you probably find Anchor's um, earnings has be, have troughed and that there's likely to be an improvement in earnings looking out to next year. And from a technical perspective, the, the chart seems to also bear that out. This downtrend, and again, this downtrend is intact from much further back on the graph than what I'm showing here. Basically, that's a two-year downtrend if I were to extend it backwards. Um, that downtrend has been broken. And also notice how it's begun to make a, a a move above these recent highs. That's at about 4 and 70 over there. It's broken the downtrend. It's broken through those highs over there. And it now appears to be finding support at this 4 and 70 area. Um, and that also corresponds with the 50-day moving average, which is now for the first time in a long time begun to turn upwards. So, you know, as an outlier, as a possible recovery play, I think Anchor Capital does look quite interesting. It's obviously a small cap stock. It's not something you're going to put all your money into. But... Um, but to me, it does have the makings of a, of a further upside, I think, both fundamentally and technically. All right, and then I decided to do one offshore stock. So I'm having a look at Tesla. This is something I've been keeping my eye on recently. And uh, this is a, it is a weekly graph of Tesla. Most of you probably know about Tesla. Elon Musk, one of the smartest South Africans that have ever left our shores, and, and gone on to do wonderful things in the U.S. Um, Tesla, electric cars, battery power, uh, tying it all in with solar power, etc. It's an incredibly exciting business um, with a very bright future, I think. Now, the share price has consolidated since 2014. You can see it basically went sideways. There was a false break down there early 2016, and then it came back into the range. So... For three, three years, it's kind of gone nowhere. And then it broke out earlier this year above this resistance, which is a bullish breakout. And you can see it's been sort of moving high. It got up to $390 per share. It's come off. That move down is actually 25%. So it might not look big on, the, on, the, on this chart, but that from there to there is actually a 25% pullback. And part of that has been on the fact that the, the new car, which is due to be released, the Model 3, which is a small, mid-sized electric vehicle. Um, I suppose you could compare it with like a BMW 3 Series or an Audi A4, that sort of size vehicle. Um, and that's really where the potential uh, sales kicker will come for this company. The production has been a bit delayed for that Model 3 vehicle. And they, they announced, I think it was a few weeks back, they announced a delay and Anyhow, I just see that as a short-term anomaly in in their life. Their plan, if I'm not wrong, is for them to produce. I think it's a hundred. I, I think ultimately it's five thousand vehicles a week, or it might be a month. I don't know. It's a lot of vehicles, um, and I'm pretty confident that they will get their production up to that point. Ultimately, it's just it appears as if it's been delayed. And it's not the first time that we've seen these kind of delays with Tesla. They seem to often delay the release of, of their new vehicles. Um, and the share price comes under a bit of pressure when that news breaks and whatever. But to my mind, that is just presenting us with a buying opportunity. Uh, and, and there's strong support here at about $290, call it $300. I've actually, last night, I bought myself some at just above $300 a share. And uh, I'm, I'm quite happy to see that from a technical perspective. I see a lot of support down here. And as I say, fundamentally, it's still one of these companies that I think has got a very bright future. And, and, and I do think Elon Musk is probably going to be like the next Steve Jobs of our era. All right. So that's that. Um, that's, that's all I've got for you. And now it is time for questions and answers. And what is it? It's 10 past six. So how's that for perfect timing, Simon? You said I've got 20 minutes for questions. Cool, cool. Folks, if we got, uh, Garth, I got one question off the interweb. Someone saying, are you taking special precautions for the elective conference? I don't know, taking straddles or any, or are you just trading what you're seeing? I do trade a lot of options. Um, 
but I don't have anything on specifically for the elective conference. So it'll still be what you see so, in the chart is what you will trade rather than, than, than... Yeah, what I trade in the chart is what I see, or what I see in the chart rather is, is what I'll trade. Having said that though, something I have been considering and I'm, and I'm still mulling it over in my head as to whether I should do this or not. Um, and this is more options, complicated jargon coming up here, uh, just <laughs> to warn you. But, but something I think could be interesting because of the, what I said about the fact that the market's really not well positioned for uh, a, a positive political outcome next year. You know, what happens if we do get a so Ramaphosa wins and all, all, all the crooks and whatever get chucked out and things start to improve and suddenly, you know, we get our country back? Um, the likes of your your Woolworths, your Mr. Prices, your you know Foschini's, the banks, the the domestic stocks that have really really been under the cosh, you probably find that stuff is very under owned at the moment, and there would need to be a big upweighting of that of stocks in that area of the market, I think. So how to play it? Because obviously I'm you know we don't know what the outcome is going to be in in December 27, uh, 2017 now, politically, but something I've considered is looking to sell put options out the money puts on some of the re retailers, say like an 85% put option. So if you take where the current price of these shares are right now, that's 100%, go 15% lower, right? Put options on the stocks at that sort of area, strikes at 15% below the current price and buy call options that are 15% out the money. Because doing that, what will happen if you do get a positive political outcome in December, these shares are going to rally and then you'll make a lot of money on your call options and your put options, which you short of, will become worthless. So you make money on both sides of that trade. On the other hand, if I'm wrong and if we do get a negative political outcome and it's more of the same, well, you know what? I think there's quite deep value in a lot of these retail stocks and, and, and the, the domestic stocks anyway. So would I be willing to buy them if they got smashed 15% lower from current levels? Yes, I would. So I'm happy to be a forced buy. I'm happy to be put. If I'm written on put options, I'm happy to be put on those options at a, at a price that's you know 15% below current levels. So to me, if I'm looking at a derivatives way or a straddle or strat, you know, options type of strategy, to play that, that's something that I've been mulling over in my mind uh, as a possible way to play it. And, and those would be options that I would look to trade a March 2018 expiry on those, if I did that. Yeah, Wayne McCurry was tweeting this morning that foreigners are very underweight South Africa, so if things go well, um, we could see a wave of buying happening, Yeah, if things go well. Um, what would you suggest would be the best way for somebody here to be able to buy offshore shares directly you know, instead of being a, through a geared kind of product? Well, there, there can be done? definitely there's lots of ways that it can be done. Um, there are a lot of providers locally that have offshore exposure or offshore operations that allow you to buy physical equities offshore. So, um, you know, not that I'm going to punt anyone in particular, but a, a common one out there is... Um, is Web Trader offered by Standard Bank, uh, and and that is actually a partnership with Saxo Bank. So it's effectively Saxo Bank white labeled as a Standard Bank product. However, you can open an account with them, and then you, you through that through that Web Trader platform, you can buy physical equities overseas. Um, you just need to send your money offshore, which they can assist you with. So you can do a million rand a year. Uh, as a discretionary allowance, which they won't ask questions. You don't need you to get tax clearance for that or anything like that. A million rand a year. And then if you want to do more, you can do up to 10 million rand per year as an investment allowance that you can send offshore. And that's physical cash that you can then use to buy overseas shares. Um, as I say, Web Trader through Standard Bank is one provider. Um, you could also do it through IG. And there are a variety of others available as well. Yeah. Um, I can't speak for each of the providers, but I, I'm, I mean, I'm not aware of any minimums. I don't so know there, are, are. there are minimums, uh, and they're typically either a thousand or ten thousand dollars. Dollars. So it's one or ten. But, but I mean, first point of call is check with your current broker, because I mean, for example, Web Trader is now also white labelled by Absa, mm. um, and I think also Sunlum, perhaps. So check with your current stockbroker as well. Uh, Easy Equities obviously is out there. So. You know, five years ago, if you'd asked that question, me and Garth would have said, well, you know, and we would have scratched our heads and, and told you about some little broker you'd never heard of. Um, 
it, it's fairly prevalent these days. I mean, most of the, the larger brokers have got some access. Then the last point is check the fees because uh, sometimes sometimes the fees are scary and sometimes the minimums. One of them, and I can't remember which, the minimum is 100,000 US dollar. That's, that's nice if you're, you know, uh, but for many of us, that's a, a lot of dollar. What would uh, that rate do to price? Probably push it up if the rand weakens <laughs> because, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, that's the reality. I mean, if, if, we, if we got a downgrade and the rand went to 15 rand to the dollar, in all likelihood, the top 40 will go up because uh, you've got Naspers being the heavyweight, Richmond, Billiton, Anglos. I mean, these are all companies that are that are dual listed. Naspers is not dual listed, but I mean, with Tencent being listed in Hong Kong, that's almost like a dual listing. Richmond is dual listed, Billiton's dual listed, Anglos is dual listed, British American Tobacco is dual listed. Um, so what happens is those companies effectively have to make parity with whatever the share prices are doing on their offshore listing. And if the RAND weakens by, by 5% or 10%, then all other things being equal, the local share prices should go up by 5 or 10% in accordance with whatever the currency does, just to make parity with their overseas listings. So, and, and keep in mind that a, in the last figure I saw was that about 70% of the top 40s earnings are now driven from offshore. And I think it's probably higher than that by now, um, either directly or indirectly. So... We are, our top 40 index is really not a domestic index anymore. It's very much a global index. And, and if the RAND weakens, the top 40 will go up. And part of that weakness of the RAND, as Garth says, is all that money that then flows out of our bonds needs to go home. Um, so just, I mean, the, the, the scary place to be will be local banks, but the market itself will be quite, I think, quite, you know, not like it, but go up from it. Yeah. Another one, um, explain Venezuela to me. I mean, it's a... Absolutely, but I mean the market's just shut up enormously. Yeah, I, so, look, I, I, okay. <laughs> I'm going to do my I'm going to do my best to answer that question because I haven't I mean I haven't examined it or studied it at, at all really. But um, my best guess, and maybe Simon can correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe he knows more about it than I do. But but my sort of best guess is that the currency has been destroyed, and and it's their market's gone up in local currency terms. And it happened in Zimbabwe as well. When the, when the Zimbabwe dollar continued to you know, go weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker, the Zimbabwe stock exchange was the best performing stock exchange in the world that year. But in, in real currency terms, if you translate it back into dollars or euros or pounds, you know, then it's a different story. Yeah, there are very few markets, and I can't even think of one, but <laughs> markets these days are, are, are not, you know, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange used to be companies that were probably within 50Ks of the stock exchange. Um, that's no longer applicable. And, and that's, you know, we, Nairobi might not have many, you know, dual listed with London, but those companies in the Nairobi Stock Exchange are operating in, in, in broadly, you know, Eastern Central Africa. So markets are less dependent on the direct economies. The currency significantly boosts them. And you go look at Brazil. Uh, 2015, when they got a, a, a quadruple downgrade, threw their president in jail, everything like that, and the market then proceeded to rally 50% in the next 12 months on, on two things. One was currency, but the other was also is that, you know, the bad news is now done and markets are looking forward. You know, our market is trying not to look at December this year. Our market is trying to look at December next year. Now, we've got an elective conference, which makes that quite hard to see through. Um, but if elective conference goes well, December next year is a better December than this one. You know, we're not rocking 4% growth, but we're rocking, well, you don't rock 1% growth, but we're doing 1%. You know, it's that sort of story, and that's what the market's doing. And you throw some currency on top of that. I mean, to me, the, 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 the big irony might be, so let's say that Saul Maposo completely walks it and every bad person in the country gets thrown into jail. This is good, right? And the rand goes to 10 and our market goes to goes down because mm -hmm. of range strength. Yeah. 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 Which is back to the first question I asked Garth, which is broadly, we can speculate all we like. Truthfully, look at the price action. Because the good scenario can see a weaker market. Yeah. Or a bad scenario could see a stronger market. Yeah. With Brayton and Capco, why are they not acting like rain hedges at the moment? All the other companies that are, you know, when they're in weekends. Yeah. Um, I know Brayton's 
Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, both companies have got their own unique challenges. Um, so just Capco, first of all, uh, very exposed to property in the UK, uh, and they've, they've been a variety of issues there. So, I mean, if you look at the Capco share price in London, it's been under a lot of pressure for a variety of reasons. And the RAND weakness hasn't been sufficient to really overcome um, the weakness in the in the London share price, if you know what I mean. So that's so th there are unique specific issues to Capco that are keeping the share price under pressure in London, and and and, and consequently here as well. Even the weaker rand has not helped it much at all. Um, and then Bright, the big uh, what appears now to be a big mistake was New Look. Um, they bought New Look fashion retailer in the UK before Brexit, and. Obviously, subsequently, Brexit has happened, uh, and, and that was not good news for, for New Look. And also, it appears that they overpaid massively for that. And they've actually this week announced that they've written that acquisition down to zero. So something that cost 37 billion rand, right? Yeah. 37 billion rand uh, two years ago is worth nothing today. So, yeah, so, so next time you make a mistake trading, just think of Bright, who lost 37 yeah. billion with a B yeah. in two years. Yeah. In fact, so, that's actually been generous, 21 months. Yeah. <laughs> but just on that, um, you know, I, I think it's interesting from the point of view now that they've written this thing down to nothing. So, so New Look, in terms of Bright's net asset value, is now worth zero. But this, the company is still solvent, uh, New Look, it's still solvent. And what's to say that it doesn't come right? And could you see quite an aggressive re-rating of the stock if New Look suddenly starts to deliver decent returns in a year or two or three from now? So to, to me, right now, New Look is like a core option that Breit owns. You know, it can't get any worse. It's already worth zero, right? But it could get better. So from that point of view, I think it actually presents an interesting prospect for possibly wanting to buy Bright if you believe that New Look could recover. Yeah, I call it the kitchen sink theory. You know, write it to zero, you've got no more downside, and, uh, you know, see what happens next. Yeah, yeah. So that's my next question. I'll now sell, because she's obviously great to do so this value with Capco. Do you think there's value accumulating some of that now while they're... Um, you know, looking here in five years, ten years, you know, long term. Uh, yes, possibly, but I think the question you've also got to ask yourself is relative to what? Um, are there better opportunities out there in the offshore listed property space? And I think there probably are. So from that point of view, you know, you've got a variety of other stocks to choose from in the in the offshore listed property space. You've got Redefine International, you've got um, Sirius Real Estate, you've got Nepi Rock, Rock Castle, all of these other ones, um, Investec, Australia Property Fund. You know, so it is it, from a from an a relative perspective, would you not prefer to maybe go into one of the other ones? And I think I probably would. I think it's a great point, the relativeness of it. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, something doubles, that's like a bit over what period, and did something else perhaps do better? Now, we mustn't beat ourselves up because, you know, I look at that graph that, that, that you showed of the top 40 stocks, and, of course, my eyes run into the ones that I own, um, <laughs> which is not NASPAS. I don't own the best, and I don't own the worst, but I do own Richmond and Discovery. Yeah. Uh, there's another question. Yes. Many companies are seems to just when, uh, when they expand offshore. Yeah. So, yeah, so um, just, just your, your view. Um, do you prefer companies that go through um, acquisitions or through organic growth? Because it seems like um, uh, acquisitions like, does carry like, a lot of risk. Yeah, it certainly has been the case for, the, for this year. We've seen a lot of examples of companies that have gone overseas and, and, and come unstuck. Um, and it's, it's actually, and I have a bit of a an interesting view on this. I, I kind of get the feeling that a lot of these overseas deals that have been done have almost been done, that they've kind of been forced deals and they haven't done great deals. I mean, let's look at some of them. So we've got Woolworths with uh, Country Road and David Jones in Australia. That doesn't look like it's been a great deal to have done, right? Um, Trueworths did a deal with Office in the UK. Also doesn't look like a good, good deal. Bright, we just spoke about New Look. It's been a disaster. Um, um, famous Brands did um, Gourmet Burger Kitchen, which now looks like an awful acquisition. You know, and, and, and I kind of get the feeling that these domestic companies 
sort of thought, oh, we're so exposed to South Africa. Let's get some offshore exposure. Let's try and get some revenue from outside of South Africa's borders. And let's just scramble around and see what we can find and buy whatever we can. And it's turned out that they've done some really bad deals. And uh, when, when, as a shareholder, in retrospect, I actually would have preferred if they had the, the, the means to do those kind of acquisitions and their balance sheet was strong and they were worried about, you know, the balance sheet becoming lazy, well, then I would actually prefer they just paid out a special dividend rather than go and force a silly deal that ultimately has cost shareholders a hell of a lot of money. Uh, so, so, you know, yes, going offshore is certainly no guarantee of, of the investment success for, when it comes to these companies expanding overseas. And there are now multiple examples of these sort of deals that have not been good deals in retrospect. Yeah, I mean, I agree. As a Woolies and as a famous brand shareholder, I'm not happy about it either. I, I take the point Garth says. There does seem to be been a sense lo- locally in the last two years to go offshore almost at any price, yeah. and, and bad deals have been done. But I take it a step further, and I challenge you folks. So forget South Africa and forget that, you know, let's look at the last 20 years. The really big deals that have worked well, I mean, SAB worked, PHP Bulletin worked, but there are a lot that didn't. And and when I do the digging, the, the, the number that keeps them coming back that says like one in three big deals really work, two in three don't. Now, I think we are currently zero in three, and I think that was the panic that we saw. Um, but that the big deals for all sorts of reasons and risks and everything else don't do the numbers they should. And that give me the money in dividends, and if I want to go offshore and buy a burger... I'll, you know, go buy an air ticket and buy a burger. Yeah. <laughs> Last question. Uh, there was one at the back. I'll Sorry. come to you after. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the story you have just related now, it took last past two years to pay in China until they discovered Tencent. Yeah. So that's actually the story. Yeah. yeah. They would have lost money. Just like these guys <clears throat> Yeah. And they don't, they can't, the companies aren't going bankrupt. You know, Willys will survive. Brake will survive. Friends Brands will survive. And maybe in time, David Jones and, and New Look and, 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 and the expensive burgers will all be profitable. The point is they've overpaid for an asset. Yeah. They've taken my money, shareholder money, and they've they've willfully used it poorly. And and yeah, the companies will, you know, Willys one day will be 100 rand stock again and Famous Brands will be 200 rand stock again, etc. But in the meantime, they've, they've destroyed shareholder value um, and I think they do it quite cleverly mm. yeah with the uh, uncertainty for next month would it be, be, be better to put it into cash and buy again in January then you know which way to go yeah <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, look if you are uncertain and, and you want to play it safe then I suppose cash is um, is a way to go but that also comes with all kinds of risks and it depends on what your well, yeah, sure, sure. Um, but again, it comes in with with a whole bunch of other questions as well. Like, what you know, are you liquidating a portfolio to do this, and what are the tax consequences of doing that, and all that sort of thing. Um, so there are variety. It's not a cut and dried answer. Uh, but if it's but if, if 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 you're a sort of a trader and you have an active trading account, which is treated as a trading account anyway, uh, and, and you're in and out of the market relatively often, and you, you're totally uncertain about what to do in December, yeah, then, then sit in cash. You know, there's always three positions. There's long, there's short, and there's cash. And cash is a position. You don't have to be invested if you don't want to. If, you, if you're too concerned about what might happen in December, there's no... Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, I can. Yeah. And I always say, sell down to your sleeping level. If you're not sleeping well at night, sell until you are. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever that might be. No, I'm deadly serious. Yeah. If you're not sleeping well at night, sell until you're sleeping. There's no point in being rich, but being so stressed you can't afford to spend the money. Mm. Uh, and that will be my parting word because we have hit our time. Uh, really appreciate, God. Thank you very, very much for your time this evening, ladies and gents. Thank you for your time. Thanks.